Welcome to the Thundercast, your martial athletics podcast produced by the fans, for the fans, with your hosts, Russ Livingood and KD Hudnall. We're bringing you the thundering word on the thundering herd each and every week. So keep it right here. The Thundercast is on the loose. Thanks for downloading another episode of the Thundercast. Follow us on Twitter at Thundercast underscore pod. And please uh, follow us on all your favorite podcasting outlets so you never miss an episode of the Thundercast. Yeah, we're a day behind this week because we had a little mishap that delayed us for a day. But hey, we're back in the saddle, right? Russ is back in the saddle, ready to ride on this huge Thundercast episode. Actually, two episodes uh, that we're going to bang out back to back. So you guys are going to see him over the course of two days, but it's going to be instantaneous for us because, hey, we don't want to bog you down too much in one day, but we've got a lot to cover. It has been a massively positive week in herd athletics overall. So uh, let's get into this with a quick word from our sponsors at 304carwreck.com. If you've been hurt in a wreck, visit 304carwreck.com on the web or on Facebook. Our roads are full of uninsured drivers. When they hurt you, your insurance company can become their insurance company. Insurance companies take your money every month, but they fight you when it's their turn to pay. Don't be a victim twice. Jason and Matt can't protect you from uninsured drivers, but they can protect you from the insurance companies. Find them at 304carwreck.com. Well, let's start this episode off. Give me five things that every herd fan needs to know this week. Five things every herd fan needs to know this week. Always brought to you by IgniteLink, the Tri-State's premier IT management team. Number one, huge news. Men's soccer wins the Sunbelt Conference regular season championship with a 2 to nothing victory over South Carolina on Tuesday. Just happened last night. And simultaneously, UCF lost to James Madison, allowing that to happen. We were one point down. They got the uh, loss, so they got no points. We got three points. We win outright. That means we will have home field advantage throughout the Sunbelt Conference tournament, and that starts Sunday at 3 p.m. against Old Dominion. Yep, it was looking um, like we were fighting that uphill battle. I mean, it wasn't looking like it. We were. We needed some help in, in from other teams to, to take some losses or some ties, and we got that. So uh, shout out to James Madison for going down to Orlando and you know playing a great game and ultimately getting the win late. I think their go-ahead goal was in like the 88th minute or something yeah. like that. I didn't watch it. I was just trying to follow on social I, media, trying to keep I tabs, it, you know. It was maybe seven and a half minutes ago, so it, seven, uh, 80, 83rd minute or something like that, but still very, very good. I don't like, really care. It could have happened yeah. in the third minute for all I care. Yeah. It, the, the point of the matter is – uh, we needed an, a, a UCF tie or loss, and we needed to win, and we got both. You know, the herd yeah. rallied, and we said last time on the last show that, you know, Marshall needs to go 2-0 and in this last – well, not take any losses. They needed to yeah. maximize their points, and and we were able to do that. Yeah. And this and this team captures Marshall's first ever team championship in the Sunbelt era. Many more to come. You know, I mean, there there's no reason to think that this soccer machine is going to – slow down because they're only getting better you know we you you often wonder like man after you have an all-time great team how do you replicate that and and we we talked in the beginning of the season like this could be marshall's best team ever and even if they don't win a national title you say man this could be their best team ever right Mm -hmm. um but we're still in the hunt baby we're coming for a second star and bringing home a Sunbelt Conference Championship, man, it feels good to get one. You know, uh, oh, I've yeah, seen a, yeah. I've seen a lot of that uh, um, on social media here. Remember, several months back when Christian posted that picture that said "Most Recent Sunbelt Championship Trophy Here," and people thought, "Oh man, that's a bold move." Well, you can put that one to bed because there's going to be a men's soccer trophy that you can now take that photo with, and uh, it w- it wasn't blank very long. Just from May until the completion of the fall sports, and here we are. We've got our first one. Yeah, um, pretty good dominating win over South Carolina to, you know, you, you don't have uh, controlling your own destiny because you have to have something else happen, but we did our part of that mm-hmm. convincingly. So 
cool team. Uh, I hope to be there on Sunday. I uh, hope all of our fans will be there to give us a home field advantage. Uh, we play extremely well at the vet. We play well everywhere, but we play extremely well at the vet. And hopefully we can uh, make some noise and take this tournament home and win regular season and the Sun Belt tournament. Yep. Uh, I, I, I can't believe this, though. I got to say this. You know, I know it was Halloween, yep. but this was the finale, and I was – Nobody claimed our tickets for that game. I, I could not believe that, right? Because it was all on the line right there. So two prime seats went empty because nobody said, yes, I can go. And, and I couldn't go. Uh, you know, we I even had a fan uh, of ours that has routinely donated tickets uh, reach out to me, uh, you know, maybe 45 minutes before the, the kick and say, I have tickets as well and everything. And I said, we were not able to give away ours. Yeah. And he said, well, I'm going to try to gr- drive down there and give them away at the gate just so somebody can go. I mean, awesome, awesome fan, which we have world-class fans and you know that. Uh, but yeah, man, I, uh, I couldn't go physically. <laughs> and yeah, also, yeah. you know, with, with the kids with trick or treat. So I understand why fans could not go. Um, but I really wanted to be there. I had to settle for uh, hobbling over to the couch and watching it there. <laughs> but still, what a great way to celebrate Halloween. You know, kiddos get trick or treat and they get candy and they, you know, they had costumes for free admission at the game anyway. So even if you went, you could have had a great time. And I saw that they had her- other herd athletes out there at the game in costume, mm-hmm. uh, handing out candy and stuff like that. So it was really cool. And I heard the SBC champs, man. That's all. That's what it's all about. That's awesome. Number two on the list here, we've got tickets to the tournament are on sale through the ticket office. Remember, always buy through the ticket office, as we always say. Uh, The um, important thing to remember is they will be individual games, not like one-day sessions. You don't get to go to the first game, then go to the second. They're clearing out the stadium, and then you would have re-entry to go back in uh, for every single game. So. Hmm. Those are on sale. You can go over to herdzone.com. You can call the ticket office at 1-800-THE-HERD, or you can stop by uh, their office on the third floor on the City National Bank at 20th Street. Just yep. make sure you get tickets. Make sure you go. Yep. We'll try to secure some as well, you know, because we are season ticket holders. And, and of course, just like every kind of postseason deal, we'll have first right of refusal, first right of refusal for our seats. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're going to try to do that, of course, put some folks in the in the vet for the postseason. We did it last year and we want to continue to do it this year. So uh, get ready, you know, get go over to Herd Zone. I also saw they posted a link if you just want to make a donation to the soccer team because you're proud mm-hmm. of them being t- uh, Sunbelt champions. You can do that as well. And there's several pricing tiers over there if you want to do that. So um, I encourage you to throw some support behind this soccer team, you know, both financially and yourself in the vet being loud and feeding this team energy because oftentimes they give it right back and then some. Yeah. Number three, we're staying with soccer. Uh, Unfortunate news here as uh, coach Michael Swan of women's soccer has not been retained. And we now have a national search underway for a new coach. Yeah. It, it, it's been a rough go of it for herd women's soccer in conference play. And that's mm-hmm. just not something that you can continually have happen. Nobody is going to be happy being, you know, ranked at the bottom in your conference. It just, it, you just can't have it, right? When there's mm-hmm. teams in this conference, uh, and I'm looking right at South Alabama, who basically ran right through, you know, they had a great conference season, then it tells you that it can be done. If Marshall can do it on the men's side in this stacked conference then we can do it on the women's side. Mm -hmm. And you would like to think that there are connections with, um, you know, our coaching staff that where you can point to the, and say, Hey, here's some, uh, you know, here's some winners. Here's some up and comers. Mm -hmm. Here's some people that can turn this program around. I'm not saying that's what they're going to do. Right. But uh, this gives Christian an opportunity to hire yet another head coach. He, He did not hire coach Swan. So, this is his opportunity to put a fingerprint on on the women's soccer program and see if we can get that whole um, both sides of the soccer program at Marshall to just elevate in a big way. Because, you know, I, I imagine it's hard. We mentioned this before to look at the success of the men's program and then look at the overall lack of success of the women's program and go, we can't have that because we know we can win in a huge fashion at soccer in Huntington. It can be done. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I, I think that 
there are some candidates out there that are going to be attractive just simply because of the fan support that's around soccer in Huntington mm-hmm. and the facility that they play in and the conference that we're in. If we check a lot of boxes. So there's there's going to be some candidates out there that want this job. But we wish Coach Schwan the best, and we thank him for his service at, for the herd. He was always uh, you know gracious to us in, in interactions with us. And um, I'm, I'm excited to see where we go from here. There's there's some you're, there's some young players on this roster that are going to provide a really solid nucleus. So you get the right coaching staff in there. You make a couple of moves. You you get a couple more players in there, and you're you're instantly far more competitive from a conference standpoint. That's really just what you got to have. Yeah, and uh, I do know that they have a very respectable crowd still going to the women's mm-hmm. games and you see tailgating before the games, you see a lot of social media love and that sort of thing. And our athletes in every single sport, women and men deserve as much uh, support from the fans as we can do to get that crowd energy, you know, to, to, to be that, you know, 12th man, that sixth man, that whatever man, that whatever woman uh, that we can provide as a crowd in that situation. Um, so hopefully we get somebody in here, uh, just get some, uh, recruiting in kind of, you know, if it's under the grassy thing to where they're bringing them in. I mean, it looks like a international, uh, best of the best team on, on our men's side, you know, so maybe follow that blueprint and work hand in hand with coach grassy. You know, I'm sure the contacts that that man has and everyone on his staff, Mm -hmm. uh, has, you know, get someone in here and and uh, really make a run with the women as we have with the men. It just doesn't get any closer than in mm-hmm. town for the blueprint right. that works. Sure. Yeah. Right? You don't have to go across country and meet with some coaches that are doing some things. They're in town, right? Same so, field. I, now I understand. I say, well, it's 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 men's game versus women's game, and the circles are different. And I get it. Yeah. It's different, different players, contacts, different people, yeah. get different contacts. But the blueprint yeah. works. Mm-hmm. Okay, so. The, give it a shot. Give it a shot. So I'm excited. I'm excited to see an initial list and start diving into, you know, who could be the next head coach and um, see what this women's program looks like a year from now or less than a year from now, because a year from now, the season will be over. <laughs> our, our final two things here. Uh, we are going to talk about the actual results and around the herd. So okay. we're going to not talk about them twice about the results, but, these two things are big enough to be things by themselves. So Abby Herring was named first team all Sunbelt during the uh, cross country uh, Sunbelt conference tournament. And just a point of note about that. She joins Tina Maynard as the only four time all conference winners for Marshall in the history of that. Yeah. The history of herd cross country. Um, we've talked about rarefied air a lot. A lot mm. when we talk about Abby Herring. Yeah. And uh, she just does not disappoint. She just brings it every meet, man. Every competitive meet, there she is, oftentimes leading the herd. You know, so this does not surprise me one bit. It was really great to see her come back for that swan song type season. We thought she was going to be done last year. And she's like, I'm coming back. I'm doing one. Got one more. Right. And to come out and have a first team all conference uh, season. Is it surprising? I mean, no. So it's just a great way to cap off an all time great career and uh, really thrilled for her. And, yeah, we've got some results we'll talk about in a little bit. But this news is just great. And the fifth and final thing is that Kylie Maston and Evan White were both named second team all conference Sun or all Sun Belt uh, tournament, uh, and we'll we'll talk about why here in a little bit. But great performances from them all year long as well. Yeah, big time. Kylie Maston always makes me smile because she looks like this just joyous person. You know, she's always got this huge smile whenever they put her on media posts or things like that. It's, it's, it's an infectious smile. It's, it, she just looks like she's having the time of her life. Really happy that she was able to uh, make second team all conference. You know, last year uh, it was all about uh, Brett Armbruster and what he did for men's, the men's track and field and, and cross country. And now it's Evan white and, and, you know, the, the trajectory just keeps edging a little higher each and every season. And, you know, once we get a full year of um, 
the whole the full off season recruiting cycle, everything. It it'll it'll be it'll be really exciting um, once we start rolling around to the beginning of of next fall. I know we have the spring season to look forward to, and that's a that's a different type of animal. But I've seen some posts out there from you know recruiting, which is not something that you see a lot in in track and field. It's it's not like football. It's not like basketball. You know, you really uh, have to find like go looking for these things or get lucky enough just to have them come across your timeline. And fortunately for us, a lot of it just comes across our timeline. So they're out there recruiting the hell out of some athletes. And um, I, I, I really, I really think we're edging in the right, the really right directions, but congratulations to, to Evan and Kylie also. Yeah. KD, I'm going to throw in a bonus thing before we get out of here, okay. just to, just to put it on the record. I did not get beat up by the chicken statue at Myrtle Beach. <laughs> so I, I know that I took round one down there in uh, in December for the bowl game and everything, and we, we were going to have a rematch, but it was uh, not the right environment to take that sort of picture uh, down there, uh, especially after the game, but uh, not from the chicken. I'm still one and zero against the chicken. <laughs> well, that's an excellent segue, I would think, into the Coastal Carolina recap. And yeah, we're a few days late on that because of, um, you know, the 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 delay we have in the show. So it's going to be a pretty brief um, recap. But there are some things that happen that we absolutely yeah. have to talk about. You absolutely. cannot just go, well, we're a day behind. We'll just skip it. Can't do that. So I'm going to fly through some of these things, and we'll have a little discussion and. I'm going to just do the stats and everything, and we're going to breeze right through it all and get to your grades so we can have all of our discussion there. So, yep. Coastal Carolina recap. The uh, Shants get the win 34-6. to six. The Herd is now 4-4, four and 1-3 four, and three in the Sun Belt. They are now last in the Sun Belt East Division, which is never where you want to be. There are two huge storylines, really, that came out of this game. And number one is, yes, the Herd has now lost four straight. That's a massive storyline after starting the year 4-0. and But the other biggest storyline is that Marshall played two quarterbacks in this game. And um, it was a mixed bag, right? Some positives, some negatives, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So let's talk about these indicators. Total yards, time of possession, first downs, third down, penalties, and turnover margin all dominated by Coastal Carolina. Not a surprise that the score came out the way it was. Total yards, 427 for Coastal, just 283 for the Herd. Time of possession, 3207 to 2753 for Coastal. First downs, edge Coastal, 20 to 17. Uh, penalty, or third downs, edge Coastal, 4 of 14 for the Herd, 5 of 12 for Coastal. Once again, neither team was very good on third down, but our opponent had just enough to get the edge over the herd. Penalties, seven for 60 for Marshall, just five for 62 for Coastal, and then turnovers. Boy, oh boy, five freaking turnovers for the herd, uh, two for Coastal Carolina. Two quarterbacks in the game, Russ. Here we go. Pretty mirror images of one another. Cam Fancher goes 11 of 22 for just a buck 25. No touchdowns, two picks. Seven rushes for eight yards. And then insert Cole Pennington into the game in the second half. 12 of 23 for just 77 yards. Also no touchdowns and also two picks. He ran uh, two times for minus nine yards, including one lost fumble at the herd one-yard line, setting up an uber easy Coastal Carolina score. Rasheen Ali in the game, just 12 carries all day for just 52 yards. Demarcus Harris, pretty bright spot through the air. Five catches for 61 yards, leads the team in both categories with a long of 27. Uh, Big bullet points here, no touchdown scored offensively for the Herd for the second straight game. Woof. The last touchdown offensively was that um, miraculous touchdown from Cam Fancher to to uh, Rasheen Ali that went 65 yards against Georgia State. And then uh, the Herd offensive line allowed three sacks to Coastal Carolina, which doesn't sound that bad, but we made that a point of emphasis. They only had seven coming in all season long, and their leader Mm -hmm. on the team only had a sack and a half. So that is a little concerning when you allow that many to a team that's not very good at getting to your quarterback. Defensively for the Herd, A.G. McGee leads the way, nine total tackles and an interception. Nice to see that youngster – get some PT and make the most of it. Eli Neal, number two this week, seven tackles, two of those solo. Defensive lineman Chris Thomas gets in on the action along with Deani Hill. Both of them have six total tackles, both three three solo, and Chris Thomas adds a tackle for loss. Impact plays, Russ, absolutely zero team sacks for the herd defense, just three tackles for loss, and we did notch one interception. Here's the big worst part thing about this whole game. 
it was a career backup quarterback for Coastal Carolina. He comes in and goes 14 of 20 for 289 yards, three touchdowns, one interception, and they Coastal was on their third-string quarterback by the late third quarter. So even the backup was out of the game early. Ouch. Uh, Reese Verhoff goes two of three on field goals with a long of 44. John McConnell had three punts on the day for a 41.3 yard average, landed two inside the coastal 20 and Jaden Harrison landed a 31 yard kickoff return yet again, still doing things in the kick return game. We're going to skip our keys this week because obviously we didn't do any of them to, in, to for, get a win. 0 for 4 on mine, yeah. <laughs> I'm not even looking back, but I'm going to assume they went 0 for 4 too. So let's go straight to grades. Quarterbacks, you get to see a little bit of two of them today mm -hmm. or on Saturday. So I guess let's go this way. What's your overall grade for the overall position? And then you can do me a little subcategory where you can talk about each one since it's a it was a different scenario, right? Cam starts the game. Cole has to come in with a lot of points already on the board. It's it's not exactly the same thing. So what do you got for this quarterback? Well, it's easy to do an aggregate for the two of them because I actually have them at the same grade, and both of that is a D plus. And yeah. largely it's because of the turnovers and no touchdowns, uh, you know. Um I'll talk about them individually briefly, and then we can go back and forth. Uh, Fancher comes in uh, middle of the road, almost 50%, a little bit above. Um, had uh, one egregious interception. His last uh, throw of the game uh, was seemingly right at the guy. I don't know if he didn't see him. I still have not been able to do a rewatch. Uh, so looking for different angles or replays, that sort of thing, I'm oblivious. So keep that in mind as I talk about some of these things. And then you had the what I called a phantom interception. It looked to me like uh, from the replay uh, on the big board that that ball was on the ground at some point. But again, it went as an interception. It was way into our um, bad place to throw two interceptions. Both of them put them in uh, scoring position quite easily. Yeah. Um, had some missed throws high, had some missed throws behind, also had some drops. You know, so one interception, not his fault. Some drops, not his fault. Uh, middle of the road on completion percentage, one bad interception. Almost the exact same stats uh, on completions and attempts for uh, Pennington. He had one interception, not his fault, because it was a drop. Same as, as Cam. One interception uh, that was his fault. And uh, then he had the fumble as well. And the thing that stood out to me is Cam had uh, 11 for 22 for 127 yards. Cole was 12 of 23 for only 77 yards. So we've heard all about this. Uh, you know, Cam's not throwing it downfield. He doesn't have as much yards per attempt. He had 5.7. And no, I'm not saying that's good, but I'm saying Cole got 3.3. Uh, and again, I'm not saying Cole is that much worse than, than, uh, Cam. I'm saying these are the stats. These are the results. Yeah. Some of them were drops. You know, I'm just saying he did not come in and have that definitive, Hey, I'm, I'm that much better and ready to take over. Both for me were a D plus. Yeah, it, it was it was just not an ideal situation, you know, mm -hmm. for either QB. The, the again, Coastal Carolina jumped out early and put up points mm -hmm. up on the board, and Marshall was stagnant, and that just puts you behind the eight ball, and you know it, right? And and so, I guess my my big concern is it's it's no offensive touchdowns for two straight weeks. Yeah. That's that's mm -hmm. there. Nah, you can't have that, man. You just can't have that. At some point, you've got to be able to string together a drive, not have a turnover, and mm -hmm. get into the freaking end zone, right? Yeah. Uh, but based on just quarterback play, it was just – it was lackluster. And this is not mm -hmm. going to turn into – look, my stance is not going to turn into a Cam versus Cole, Cole versus Cam. Yeah. It ain't going to be that, all right? Whoever's so, on the field, that's who we're after. If folks are thinking that's what it's going to be, you're wrong because I'm mm -hmm. not going to sit here and disparage one kid – because you think I want to see somebody else. That's right. not the game I play, right? That might be the game that you guys want to play. You can play that. I'm not playing that. I'm I'm going to root for whoever's taking the snaps on the field at the time. I want to see them all do well because that mm -hmm. directly correlates to wins for the herd, which right. is the big That's goal. Right. But it is no you, – you, you just can't deny that it wasn't a great performance by either guy. Right. I understand that Cole comes into the game and he's already – vastly behind the eight ball with yeah. it, on the scoreboard, right? And Marshall's not being able to do anything, and I get it, man. And um, 
I'm going to say this, man. He looked good. He came in the first drive, drove him right down the field. It was the longest drive of the day for the herd, both in both point, uh, plays and yardage. But we couldn't get anything out of it. You know, it was, it can't find the end zone. And then the second drive couldn't be, could not have been worse. Mm -hmm. Two plays and you fumble on the one. I mean, that honestly, other than fumbling in the end zone or having that be a scoop and score is the only other thing that could have been worse. So it was not ideal. He faced adversity early. Um, then, then it was, it was a situation to where we were going to go for it on a fourth and one, we get a false start penalty. Now it's fourth and six. And you're thinking, all right, well, at least they got the balls to go for it. We're going to go for it. Hell, we got to lose. We're already down. Might as well go for it. And I'm with it. I'm not one of those fans that said, well, you know, I probably would have kicked field goal here. We mm -hmm. kicked two field goals. It's 34 to six. Well, hell you need a touchdown, yeah. right? Go for it. Yeah. You need several touchdowns. You just right. got to go for it. So the, the problem that happened after that, which most fans saw immediately as the fourth and sixth call, you roll your quarterback out to the basically the wrong side because you're used to, I'm assuming, having a lefty quarterback, which would have been the right, the correct side for your lefty guy. But now your your right-handed quarterback is thrown across his body. It was not ideal, right? And it didn't work. And he ended up getting sacked. So it was just, it was, you know, a couple things just weren't okay. And then we were driving down the field late and the ball hits. It was either Pierce or Harris. I can't remember. And right into the hands of the defender. And I'm like, damn it, man. You know, that would have been nice to at least get a potential touchdown on the board there. Neither guy was super sharp. Cole had some great throws, uh, but he also had some errant throws. You expect yeah. that from a young guy, right? You expect yeah. that from a young guy. And most folks are immediately always going to compare Cole to Chad, right? Chad had that great five interception performance as a freshman. People talk about it all the time. Mm -hmm. So I'm not the I'm not the guy that's going to be like, well, he ain't the answer. He ain't the right. dude. I, who do I? I don't know. Nobody yeah. knows. This yeah. is the first meaningful game action for Cole Pennington ever. He yeah. got into the game against Norfolk State last year. A couple of plays here and there when we played six quarterbacks, but that's not only, meaningful game only, action. Only handoffs. So he did not right. have a throw. Yeah. This is meaningful game action. So right now there's there's I, I think it's fair to say there's question marks around quarterback. There there have to be because mm -hmm. all of a sudden we haven't been able to score offensively. Marshall's on a four game skid. These questions are gonna pop up. There's nothing wrong with asking the questions. Yeah. As long as you're just not dogging the hell out of the kid, right? Because that's just that's low brow, that's the low hanging fruit. Okay. So I saw some things I liked and I saw a lot of things, five turnovers that I didn't like. Yeah. Um, with you, I think that ball hit the ground that came through. They slowed it down, but I, I, I said I they called. They said the 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 call stands. They didn't say the call was confirmed, so it just tells me that it was in that gray area where they couldn't overturn it. Yeah. But it looked like it hit the ground in real time. It looked like it did not, but on the slowed down replay, it did. But neither here nor there. Thirty four to six ain't gonna ain't gonna cut it. And quarterback play just has to be better. That's it. Yeah. it just has to be better. And I, I think uh, a couple of points on stuff you made, I think that, you know, we've continually seen some wide receiver and tight end drops. We saw them for both quarterbacks here today. We've uh, seen uh, some miscommunication where I don't know if it's on the receiver running the wrong route or the quarterback throwing uh, the wrong route. Uh, but there's uh, some obvious miscommunication. There was yet another miscommunication on a handoff uh, where you're, uh, Fancher was going to hand it off and Ali was on the other side. Maybe it was uh, Roberts. I can't remember if it's Ali or Roberts now, but he ran to the left. The handoff was to the right. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've seen that a couple of times this year. So there's some obvious things that have to be uh, changed. You know, we've got to get on the same page and uh, our quarterbacks are going to be at a disadvantage if we are having drops. You know, those are drive enders, drive killers especially a lot of these times they've happened on third down and it's been past the uh, first down line. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did think that uh, Cole came in and he was scary accurate on uh, several plays through the ball very well. And then on others, he was scary inaccurate mm -hmm. uh, throwing it uh, two or three yards uh, in front of the receiver into the ground, uh, throwing it uh high uh to the running back on a swing pass or a screen to where the running back uh had to jump and extend his arm just to get it um it's going to happen we're pro whatever quarterback is the one that is in the game at that point uh i don't care if it's uh uh Paracek, i don't care if it's harrison i don't care who it is that's who we as fans are going to back you know, we want our team to do well, so we want the quarterback to do well. 
that's the way it is. Whoever's the punter, whoever's the offensive line, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't matter, right? right. Yeah. They are a son of Marshall, and hopefully they are helping our team uh, get a victory, right? That's yeah. who we that's who we want to cheer on. So uh, I know there is going to be talk about who will start. That is a very, very uh, logical question uh, after this. You know, who's going to get to start on Saturday? Will it be a split time? Uh, will someone else, uh, either than those two, get some action? I think those are all logical questions, but it's also one of those. Uh, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. You know, some people may think there's a right or wrong answer, but I think that you've just got to see, hey, who's going to help us lead to victory in this game? Because it's a must win game coming up. Yeah. And we're, I mean, we're going to talk about that a lot more in the preview. I just let, wanted to hit that during the quarterback. Great. Well, let me mention real quick before we move to the offense as a whole, what I think we'll see. I think Cam Fancher starts, and I think you might see, you know, a, a series here or, um, you know, some time for another quarterback, just part of the game plan, you know. Um, and if if production r- remains at the levels that we've seen it for the past couple of weeks, Huff said it, you know, if you're not performing, we're going to put somebody in there. Now that falls on the other guy that we put in there to outperform who we took out. Otherwise – you know, you haven't proven that you belong in there either. So I think you might see, um, you know, a little bit of two quarterbacks, maybe a drive here or there, or a series here or there, because let's let's not forget, Cam was always part of the offense when he wasn't the starter. They always had a package of plays. He would always come in for a series and or drive and, and you know, provide a change of pace. And we might be back to that thought process right now. But ultimately, it's what, do what you got to do to win a game. Right. Just Mm -hmm. do what it takes to win a game. And there's no denying that Cole came in and provided a spark for this hurt offense. He did. He absolutely did. He came in and took him down the field. So I think it's it's appropriate or uh, understandable that you would see both guys play. Yeah. Uh, But I think it's still Cam's job. He's still QB one. He has not uh, taken, you know, I, I don't if if if. If Cole would have come in and passed for 250 yards and three touchdowns and no interceptions, you might have a more pressing argument to say, well, it looks like Cole's got the hot hand. It might be time to make the switch, but that didn't happen. I, I don't think there's an argument to be made at that point. I think it would be a clear cut choice, you know, yeah. that uh, you say, hey, w- we've had uh, struggles scoring the last few games. This guy's coming in and making an immediate impact. But, yeah. you know, the, there were a couple of uh, on the two uh, sacks that, that he, took uh you know of uh oh i have to get rid of it that first one that he took was almost a turnover he just was ruled down before he threw it away uh and then that second one that that was that was bad you yeah. know and you're going to expect that out of someone he's a freshman right that's right like we've been saying last year for, with fancher he's a freshman this year he's a sophomore you know he didn't start the whole season last year you know so it's uh young quarterbacks you're going to have things like this so yeah I, I, we did I, not, we, yeah go ahead i was gonna say i just think we'll see a little bit of split time i could be yeah. wrong cam could come out and light it up against app state and you're like nope he's he he they pressed the right buttons to say hey you got to do better and he's doing better i don't know man yeah. it just feels like you know we're gonna we we still have to get two wins in this season to mm-hmm. to become bowl eligible so there's still a larger goal Mm-hmm. you know, at, at hand here. So you can't just sacrifice your season when there's still something on the table that you need to attain. So if Marshall, God forbid, goes out and loses seven straight, well, then at that point you can go, okay, we really need to build toward next year. We can it, – it, th- th- we're not going to a bowl, blah, 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 blah. There's some other things you can do. As long as there's six wins on the table, you got to try to get six wins. Yeah, and so, it's important to note that neither of these players we're talking about are seniors and exhausting their eligibility. And right. the same with everybody in that quarterback room except for T.J. McMahon, who we brought over from Rice as a, uh, you know, early season uh, – insurance policy you know Mm -hmm. if something would have happened uh so building for the future doesn't necessarily mean putting in your qb2 uh over your qb1 in the traditional sense that you're saying well he's a senior it doesn't matter get him out of here we're talking about a sophomore and a freshman and then behind them freshman 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 so we've got young people in here uh to get a head start on next year and that might not be just these two that we're talking about here today 
Yep, that's right. So let's move into offense. What you got for offense as a whole? Like I said, just 200 and some odd offensive yards, no touchdowns again. Ali only 12 carries. What do you got? You're going to see a theme here today. I'm giving them a D. Um, okay. A lot of these, I'm, I'm not giving out any Fs today. And the reason that I'm doing that is that these athletes are still coming in, a lot of them banged up. Uh, they're going through adversity here, three straight losses and that sort of thing. I don't, I don't feel like I want to give anybody an F. Okay. And I'm just, that's, I'm putting that out there. Uh, it doesn't matter how bad of a performance I'm not giving anybody an F. So the offense gets a D it's uh, concerning to me that we have drives that stall, uh, turnovers are going to happen. Hopefully you can, uh, alleviate those turnovers and minimize those turnovers, but, what I don't like is um, the penalties and then the just the incompletions and the uh, stops for two yards when you need five on a run, that sort of thing that's preventing us from moving the ball, sustaining these drives, putting us in a position to score. We're just not doing it. Yeah. So D overall. It seems like we've gone backwards a little bit mm-hmm. because it, at seven, eight games through the season, you have to consistently be able to put together an eight, nine, ten play drive yeah. multiple times in a game. You have to be able to continually get ten yards at a time if you need to. If it takes you three plays to get ten yards, you need to be able to do that a couple times a game, a couple drives a game. You know, you need to be able to do that. And and it just doesn't look like we're able to do that. And if we do do it, we can't cap off the drive with with a touchdown or with some points. You know, so. And we moved into tempo a couple of times and we started really humming as an offense, which we've seen all season long. But then even in the tempo, all of a sudden, mistake, mistake, boom. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't take we long. We don't have the ball. Yeah. We you go to you go into tempo, it doesn't take long. It's a it's a it's a no gain on on a run play or a dropped pass or two quick drop passes, and now you're third and long. Yeah. I get I get the double edged part of that sword, mm-hmm. but it seems like Marshall has been better. It just Maybe I'm seeing it wrong, but but it just looks like, hey, we're we're more efficient when we go a little quicker. And I get it. You can't always do that, whatever. I get it. But something's got to happen. Uh, I think it's concerning for me that it, it at some point I don't care what the score is. Um, if you're down whatever it is, I don't I don't know. If you're down 21 to 3 and you know your offense is struggling in a big way, I don't think you can just simply – move away from giving the ball to your best player. You know, uh, Rasheen Ali has to have more than 12 carries in a game. I think from my perspective, it was obvious that he was nowhere near 100%. He was well enough to play and everything. He was just not his normal cutting and explosive self. And that sometimes after, uh, you know, a run, he would uh, leave and he'd be out for the rest of that series or that series and the next series. It seemed to me like, you know, he was out there because he was good enough to go. He just was not good enough to be prime Rasheen Ali. Yeah. And, and I think that's why he only got 12 carries. I don't think it was any kind of game plan. I think that we had to deviate away from that game plan of feeding him that rock because he just physically could not do it. We saw Roberts in for, uh, several plays and pain in and uh, Rasheen was absent and conspicuously so for several times. And we saw players like that on defense. We just got guys that are banged up right now. I know. I know. Uh, But it doesn't have to be, well, I guess I said you got to have more than 12 carries. I guess it means like try to work him into the pass game a little bit more because we know he's a viable option and he's probably a mismatch against certain players in certain scenarios. And, and we've seen him make big plays. I mean, for crying out loud, he's got the last offensive touchdown on a pass play, you know. So we know he can do it. It was just not, you know, this trend has to end. Huff knows it. Coaches know it. Players know it. The trend's got to end. you got to put points mm-hmm. on the board. You don't have a prayer to win games if you don't put points on the board. And I will say this. And actually, I'm going to save it until the coaches. Defense, what do you got? D minus. Uh, we got gashed by their big plays. And that was one of the keys that I said, you know, they had – 77 yards, 54 yards, 52 yards, 60 yards, all these different big plays from their receivers, from their running backs. You know, uh, we've got to limit that, and we didn't. They came out throwing. uh, They were, I mean, beautiful passes hitting people in stride. I mean, dropping dimes. But I saw missed tackles. I saw them pick up an extra seven where we should have stopped them. Uh, ended up with uh, first downs, extending drives, that sort of thing. 
Uh, we didn't capitalize on some shore interceptions that really would have altered the way this game was going, you know. Um, and one of those looked like if it wasn't going to be a pick six, it was at least going to be a 40 yard return to give us favorable field position and things like that matter. There was, mm-hmm. uh, there's problems in execution all game long. Um, D minus again, like I said, I'm giving out no F's today. Yeah, it was rough, man. Pass coverage was rough. Uh, even Abraham got picked on, which was yeah. surprising to see, you know, and uh, Huff mentioned in the press, in the presser that they, that we started two freshmen at safety. So you could tell there was a, a marked, um, difference not having jj roberts back there he's a difference maker and so there was some growing pains with having some youngsters there and and if you watched huff's uh press conferences then you get some insight into why he's like well we saw some positive things it was like they made you know the wrong type of coverage thing they went inside when they should have been over the top it wasn't a matter of well this guy just can't play the position it was they Mm -hmm. made some mistakes that way they're still very much able physically able to play the position That we just talked about with young quarterbacks, you expect them to make mistakes. You expect young defensive backs to make mistakes. So these aren't excuses. It's just Mm -hmm. what happened, you Mm -hmm. know. Uh, Special teams, what do you got? I have an A-plus here, and I know that we missed a field goal, but it was a 49-yarder, and it wasn't by that much, and the guy had been nailing them uh, on a great run. We had a uh, all-game long, Harrison had no chance to or designed to have no chance because they were over his head into the end zone. Finally, at the end of the game, he had nothing to lose. He says, don't care if it's eight yards deep. I'm going to catch it. Had a 31-yard run. We had that blocked uh, field goal. We had a recovery on a punt. Uh, McConnell was solid all game long. We didn't give up very much in the return game uh, all around. A-plus effort. That's uh, two weeks back-to-back after we thought the worst – well, we know – the worst performance of the year that they put up in special teams, they have come out and uh, said, shut your mouth. We're an A plus uh, unit. And they performed that way the last two weeks. Yep. They sure have against really two pretty good teams. And it's been a vital part of keeping Marshall in a game or, you know, providing opportunities for, for Marshall to get on the board, right? You block Mm -hmm. a field goal, keep it a tighter game. You recover a muff punt to set yourselves up to get points. You weren't able to really do that, but it was an opportunity right there Mm -hmm. to, you know, make this game more of a game. Special teams has been a real bright, bright spot since Georgia state. They have been. And Huff said it then we haven't done anything different. Same players, same coverage, same calls, same everything. It's just, you know, you guys, he's not directly talking to us. Maybe he is. I don't know. He's like, but you guys, you know, skewer us when it's when you see what you see and it costs us. But, you know, we do the same things and nobody really says anything. Well, we do say, say, we say it's been good, but. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, that's why these grades are so hard. We're not at practice and we don't see what they're doing. All we're doing is looking at the performance on the field. And it's a guess on whether that's a coaching decision or whether yeah. that is a uh, performance on uh, execution. And fans are going to believe what they're going to see with their own two eyes or their preconceived notions of what they think that it is. But these grades are ultra hard as someone that's not out there on the sidelines and not out there on the field. Well, when I grade something, it's mostly based on what I see and my reaction to that. So I don't, it's not so much. It's like, I don't get into necessarily saying, well, you know, the, the play calling X in this game was terrible. It should have been different play because I, I based a lot of my grades on the execution of said play calls, right? right. That, that's, that's where the most of it lies for me. It's like, well, if they're going to call it this way. You execute it that way. And mm-hmm. if you execute it and it still doesn't do anything positive, well, then you can go back to play call, right? All yeah. right. So what do you got for the uh, coaches this week? I got a D again. Uh, the only bright spot on the, on the game was the uh, special teams, which we've already covered. And I just said, these are so hard because, you know, I know that the coaches didn't go out there and say, hey, call the uh, uh, five uh, turnover game plan. You know, we want to score no touchdowns. We want five turnovers, but somehow we're going to win this game. No one did that, obviously. You know, Uh, so I just feel like uh, it seems like the energy is low. Uh, It seems like the uh, execution is not there. The penalties are there. And I, sorry, the coaches are catching it. You know, yeah. uh, I, I got a D for them. Uh, you know, you go down there and win somehow in that game. And all of a sudden your coaching goes up to an A plus. 
uh, does that mean that because we came down with an interception that we otherwise didn't, or those calls that were interceptions shouldn't have been, uh, get a, a first down spot that the referee misses something like that. It doesn't change how the game was coached or the game was designed. The results different and the grade goes up. So yeah, I don't that's, know. That's just fans, football and, and coaches. That's how it is. And it's always going to be that way. You know? I know it's just, uh, I'm just trying to get across how, how uh, subjective these grades are. And yeah. Yeah. Well, here's what I got to say about the, the, the coaching thing. Your, your coaches are charged with putting your players in the best position to win, right? That's mm -hmm. what your job is as a coach. We all know that, that, you know, so um, the energy level was not matched between these two teams. It wasn't. And it was, they even said that on the broadcast, which is something you really don't hear a lot, but they were like, you know, in this must win, basically elimination game, Coastal's all, all the energy and Marshall's really flat, you know, and, and it, it, it did come through that way. And you can't necessarily just, you can't come into a game like that. You can't, you know, you, you, you're on the road. You'd much rather be at home, but you're on the road. So what? You're on the road. It, the game still is basically an elimination game. If you've got to manufacture your own energy, then do it. <laughs> You know, but when it comes through on the broadcast, then it's it's an, it's apparent. It's not like, am I seeing this right? It's like, no, it's 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 really coming through. Now, I will tell you this. I like a lot about what you said. If a play here and a play there goes differently, you're you probably go, wow, these coaches really had them going. Right. But it didn't work. So right. the post game, this was this was probably the um, most candid that Huff had been in a presser this season, you know, and, and he was talking about. Uh, a lot of the things that that um, or maybe it was the 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 presser one of the two or maybe a little of both he was very candid was talking about well at some point we can't just say we have to execute better we have to actually execute better you, know, you can't just say it you know so I, I applaud them for, for him for coming out and taking that stance right because that's the type of thing that fans you know want to hear their ball coach say they want to say they want to hear him say you know, time for saying we have to do it is over. We actually have to do it. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the announcers during the game said, well, if you're Marshall, I think you have to go back and find out who you are, and that has to happen in practice. So it's probably a very interesting week of practice this week. What What's the mm -hmm. focus? Are we rediscovering an identity? Are we trying to figure out who we are? I don't know. You know, I'm not there. But I just thought that was an interesting point to make because this is a big game. Yeah. If you, Marshall fans want to beat App State. They do. You know, they want to beat Appalachian State. Marshall players hopefully really want to beat Appalachian State. I know the coaches do, right? But the uh, fan base really wants to beat App. And if you go into Boone in front of a sold-out crowd and you beat them, you you change a little bit of the narrative of your story. Because now all of a sudden it's like, hey, we got to get one game, you know, in these final three to be bowl eligible. This is it, man. If you don't beat App State, it's a real uphill battle. Georgia Southern for 75 week, they're kind of rolling right now. Then you got South Alabama, who's kind of in the same boat as Marshall, very underperformed this year for, for based on preseason prognostications. And Arkansas State now has become more of a wild card. Who will show up? Who yeah. are they? Are they a good and I mean, I know they're good enough to come into Huntington and win. So that you can't chalk up as a dub just automatically anymore. Right. So you got to get this one. You got to get this one. But overall, I, I think your coaching grade is fair. But I just wanted to give them a little bit of props for coming into the the uh, press conferences and yeah. saying, "Hey, we, we get it. You know, we we can't just say we've got to do better. We actually have to do better." What do you got for the fans this week? I got a D plus, and it's mainly because we made a huge showing down there uh, in attendance. Uh, we were. All over, I I couldn't go anywhere in, in Myrtle Beach proper without running into fans, and these weren't at designed get-togethers or something. Right. It's just the hotel I stayed in, uh, the restaurants surrounding there. You know, going into parking lots, everywhere I saw it was herds, uh, herd uh, fans, and it was um, great tailgate environment with uh, herd fans all around. Uh, the thing that gets you is because there's a loss automatically saying I'm giving up on everything, you know, uh, personal attacks on players and on coaches, you know, 
uh, saying that someone shouldn't be a player or a coach at a high school level, you know, asinine statements, you know, uh, worst uh, X in division one, you know, asinine statements, we've got to do better. And one thing that I want to say, which kind of bleeds into the overall, this was homecoming for coastal Carolina and for them getting 21,324 or 234, whichever the two it was, was a huge thing for them to do. Mm -hmm. Um, But the pregame walking by there, which by the way, nobody said a bad thing ever to me on the way into the game. Only after they got ahead is when you started to hear bad things. And I know that there were other fans that had horrible experiences, but they had an entire field of students, fraternity, uh, sorority, that sort of thing. They had, I mean, massive, massive pep rally tailgating. I feel like that's where the energy was. You know, uh, we have an opportunity as fans to affect a game. We talked about it in this show. We've talked about it every show. And they had that environment down there. And it bled over to the players, and it seemed to me to impact. And we as fans have to be able to do that too. You can't just beat your chest and say, we've got 2,500 here, we've got 3,000 here or whatever, and then start a let's go herd before the game. And then when one little thing goes wrong, say, "Ah, I knew it, same crappy team, I'm going to the hotel or I'm going to wherever, you know, we've got to do better as a fan base. And people can get mad at me for saying that all they want, but I put it on Twitter. If anybody has not read it, you can go over and find it at Russ living good. Uh, we as fans owe these players and this team to cheer them on. And sometimes we have to look and say, am I going to be there no matter what? I'm hoping like hell I can still make it to Boone, which I have tickets for, but right now I just can't walk. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to do everything I can to limp around at Boone and probably get heckled by every fan uh, coming and going in a bad environment just to go down there and cheer on my team. And I hope that that doesn't sound super fanish, like I said on, uh, on social media, but they need us right now. When you're down, that's when your team needs you the most. And I saw a lot of fans jumping ship or saying things just to get the clout and the reactions and everything. And we got to stop. Yeah, I think a lot of that is that, you know, people, some people are so desperate to become a, some kind of beacon for, you know, herd fandom that they'll say just about anything, you know, I mean, golly, I was attacked this week for, (laughs) well, you should be, (laughs) I know, right? Not not for your views, just because of who you are as a person. Just because of who I am as a human. (laughs) No, I mean, I, like I care, you know, I don't yeah. care. We do this for fun. Right. right. And, and yeah. we do this to provide herd fans with an aggregate, a, an aggregate news source so they can keep up with all of our herd athletics programs. And by and large, that has been a, an overwhelming positive that people tell us. Thanks for t- letting us know about tennis and track. And that's really cool. I appreciate that. But it's also because we just we just love the herd and and, and yeah. it's fun for us to talk about it this is, stuff and I, and I don't give a sh- I don't give two shits if people like attack me it, I don't lose a wink of sleep at night got a wife that still loves me kids that love me like I don't care man you if you if you feel like what you need to do is show up on a Saturday during the game and just chime in for the week and tell me I'm horrible and that I <laughs> and that I that I I have to uh, buy tickets to give away just to you know be cool. <laughs> okay. If you say so, like whatever, do better. You know what yeah. I mean? Do better. I don't, yeah. you can, please feel free to, like I said last week, start a competing podcast, go up against us. If you don't like what we do, Hey, it's, it's really easy to start yeah. your own, do it. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and if that's fine, but I don't have to engage with these folks. I wish some of them were more positive, but I don't care. You know, I don't care. You be whoever uh, you want, but just let you know, you have, you, you, there are consequences to the things that you say. You are talking about real people that exist in this world mm -hmm. and karma is a real thing. It's a Mm -hmm. real thing. So, you know, I just choose to be positive when I can, you can't Mm -hmm. always be positive. And when things are bad, they are bad. And you know what? Two weeks ago, I told you or a week ago or whatever. I said, I should have let it all marinate before I, I and I did that this week. And, you know, I didn't engage in some emotional reaction to some to some things. But 
sometimes when you put things out there, it's not an emotional reaction. It's it's what happened. Marshall lost yeah. four straight games. That that right. happened. You know, right. that's a, that's not like, oh, well, he hates him now. And here we go. He's he's now going to, you know, start talking down about the team. No, you actually lost four games. Like yeah. nobody wants that. Right. So you got to talk about it. But yeah, I think we have a friend of the show and a friend personally that uh, I saw posted a perfect meme. Right. Just because I play complain doesn't mean I stop caring. Yeah. Right. And that's pretty accurately a lot, encapsulated. A lot of people complain because they care, but they yeah. do it in a constructive manner and a, I'll always be here. Not, you know, it, some of it almost seems like you're wanting failure just so you can say you were right or so you can complain and, and everything, man, I don't hate myself that much. I want to <laughs> win every damn game, you know? And yeah. I mean, I know a lot of, a lot of people only know me through watching or listening to this, you know, yeah. they don't actually know the real rest living good or whatever. But, uh, if if you think that I care about what anybody thinks about me, no. you 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 haven't been on this planet for forty four years in a close enough circle <laughs> to know about me, because yeah. I, I I legitimately might be the the most uncaring what anybody else thinks person on the, in the world. You know I I care about what if if I'm happy with my decisions at the end of the day, that's the one person I got to please, man. Yeah. I, I love. Um, my, I think my favorite thing this week was somebody telling me that like um, we needed to stop. I, I I can't remember the term, but I'm just going to say kissing up, kissing up to like Marshall Athletics and the admins and the coaches and players. And if we're if we're honest, then we'll our platform will grow. Yeah, I think we're pretty honest when when we talk about things. And oh, by the way, our platform has grown exponentially. Because I think we do things the right way. Yeah. You know, there's a fine line. We have great relationships with with uh, the university and, and coaches and a lot of our players. And it sometimes gets awkward to have to say certain things, but it doesn't mean they didn't happen. You know, right. it's about being it's about talking about what has happened without trashing right because that's what that's where you cross the line so i'm never shy about talking the about the negative things that have happened it's just like i'm not going to drag a player why do people think that you have to do that to in order in order to prove your point like you can prove you can better prove your point without doing that if that's what you have to do you're not proving a point at all anyway. hang on hang on i'm gonna reach down here and get all these uh media credentials and uh money yeah. that i get from the university please like, right here they are in my empty hands i didn't get uh, my pay stub this week yeah, come on yeah. get freaking real yeah but yeah. uh man i the the entire reason we started this podcast was to highlight and bring positivity to all sports at marshall because there was nobody else doing that mm -hmm. just because a football game is a loser on the, on the scoreboard does not mean that all of a sudden we're going to say, well, let's, let's stop doing everything that we said we were going to do to start this podcast and just tear down everybody over a loss. Yeah. No, you know, it's, it, we're here to be uh, positive for Marshall university athletics. Yeah. You know, we talked about cross country and everything. Who else was talking about that before? And and they, Abby Herring, how often have we talked about her and how deserved she is to be talked about? Yeah. Nobody was doing that, man. That's what we're doing is trying to let everybody know all the good stuff that's going on. But yep. that's enough for me about the fans. So. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. How about an overall grade? Let's, let's breeze through these last three. What's your overall grade? Overall for me was a D and uh, almost all of that was getting to spend time with my old roommate, Luke. Uh, I did have to leave immediately after the game and uh, didn't get home till 516 in the morning, driving straight through. And uh, I didn't get a better experience of getting to have an extra day on the beach or an extra meal out or things like that. Uh, always tough on the road for loss, but it's always good to go. Just giving a D. Yeah, uh, a win would have vastly changed that. Hell, and even, oh, a, yeah. even a closer loss would have changed right. that. Yeah. Um, but, you know. It, there's no way to sugarcoat it four straight and, a, and, you know, basically just getting outperformed in all phases of the game, minus some great special teams plays. You're going to, you're going to earn that grade. So it's rough. Who's your offensive MVP for the week? Uh, I didn't have one. I had yeah. special teams being our MVP. Okay. 
Well, that's that's tough. You know, it's it's hard to highlight something when you don't find the end zone. Nobody had a really great receiving day. Nobody had a really great running day. If I had to say anything, I'd say it was really nice to see some of those youngsters get in there and yeah. make some plays. Yeah. That was pretty good, you know, so, to uh, see some guys behind – uh, that you know, uh, uh, Roberts had some nice runs in the game late in the game. Some of these uh, defensive guys, even though that's defensive, were making some nice plays. That's pretty nice. Mm-hmm. So, who's your defensive MVP this week? AG McGee uh, yeah. led us in tackles, got an interception. Uh, just overall, good game. It's good to see him step up. Sure is. Special teams, who you got? Uh, the entire unit, man. Uh, we punted well. We, uh, I mean, even though it was a muffed punt reception uh, by the other team, you still have to be Johnny on the spot to get that yep. recovery. You've got to fight uh, underneath all those guys that are going for the ball. You've got to be in the position to get that. You don't just luck into it bouncing to you. It comes from being prepared and being in the right spot. You know, so uh, blocking the kick, uh, team effort, not just the guy that got his. Uh, hand up to block it, but everybody that allowed that penetration to happen. So just overall team effort, uh, give the entire unit an uh, MVP. I'm with you. Uh, You got anything else? Let me have it. Otherwise, let's take it around the herd. Let's take it around the herd. So we're going to start out with cross country and talk about how these people got first and second team that we mentioned. The women placed third out of 13th in the Sunbelt Conference Championships, and the men finished sixth out of nine. Abby Herring finished second overall at 16 minutes, 49 seconds in the 5K. That's flat out getting it. Mm -hmm. And that broke the school record again. Shocker. Who'd she break? Her own again. (laughs) Uh, Kylie Maston also finished in the top 10. Evan White finished seventh in the 8K. And we mentioned that Maston and White earned second team all Sunbelt Conference honors and Herring earned first team. Uh, Great. Great, great performance from cross country this semester. Yep, sure was. It was a great, great, uh, especially the women. They they seem to be performing, outpacing the, what the men did from a team standpoint all year long. But, hey, when you've got one of your Mount Rushmore of women's cross country competing currently, you're going to have that. You know, yep. so just I'm really happy for them. I really am, man. They, they, they you know, for that's a sport that just doesn't perform in front of a crowd. You know what I mean? So you just kind of have to do it. And there's something to be said about that. Well, it's one of those things, like, even if you want to go watch this, I mean, where do you go over the (laughs) 3.1 miles that you're there for a 5K or longer? You know, you... I, I know that I'm not going to get on a scooter and drive around through the runners, you know, so I can be cheering them and watching them the whole time. So it's just tough to do. And right. they go out there and they just represent themselves, the athletic department, their alma mater, us fans. They do it all. Uh, my hat's off to them, man. And, and Abby, we cannot say enough about her and her career on what she's done. Yep. It was awesome. It was so awesome. Where we got next? Baseball picked up a couple of commits. We got Braylon uh, Cordonier. Uh, hope I'm saying that right. 2025 shortstop slash right hand pitcher, and Landon Dahl, a 2025 left hand pitcher. Yeah. Uh, if I I, I want to do, uh, I should have had the uh, stats the, and everything. The, well, not the stats, but the uh, the measurables. Oh yeah, Dahl was is six three two oh five. So I like that. I like a nice big tall pitcher that. Uh, that always seems to kind of get you a little extra velocity when you need to. And uh, I don't know, I, I put out the tweet from those guys on their commitments and I had some of those velocities and stuff on their pitches out right. there. It looks pretty good. Lots of 2025 yeah. uh, flavor, still a lot of growth and development, you know, yes. fairly young guys. So, you know, if you can extrapolate even minimal gains in development, these are going to be potentially two nice weapons. And, yeah. you know, Greg Beals has shown that, um, he can he can surround himself with coaches to maximize what these guys are able to do. So bringing in the right pitching coach, I think we have that. Um, these young pitchers, I think we're going to see a big rise in um, you know herd baseball. We've talked about that a lot, and and there's just no way of knowing without seeing it. And it's probably going to be a two to three year process, honestly. Mm-hmm. And uh, unless you're able to hit the portal pretty hard and get some guys that are already developed, as far as in house development. You really don't know what this herd's going to look like until Beals has the opportunity to get these recruiting classes in and cycle them for a couple of years and then see what these guys start to look like. But, man, I tell you, if you haven't followed herd baseball recruiting closely, 
because admittedly we haven't, we're not that old as a show, right. but um, over this last year, it's been really exciting. It's been, mm -hmm. it's, there seems to be a lot of uh, young talent that's going to make its way to Huntington, West Virginia. And, you know, to be able to now draw a brand new park and, and show them, this is where your locker is. This is your facility. This is where you'll be, man, that, you know, that helps. Uh, and when I talked to coach Beals in the uh, interview with the Thunder Trust a couple of months ago, he mentioned personally for him that this ballpark and these facilities are going to enable him to manage the team completely differently and, and than he was able to do without kind of their own home and how much time it will save these guys, how much, uh, how many hours and minutes it'll put back into their hip pocket every day for them to be better student athletes. You just can't talk enough about what this means, but dude, the the uh, the the trail of young talent coming to Huntington for herd baseball, you got to be pumped about it. You do. Uh, football also picked up a commit from Javon JJ Hammonds and Edge from the class of twenty twenty four. Yeah, uh, came through last night. I saw that fairly late last night, so um, I was going to wait till today to put up the tweet. I haven't put the tweet up yet, but since we're talking about it, I will. Uh, he's from Wayne High School in Dayton. If that makes any bells go off for you guys. It kind of should because that's the same high school that uh, one herd quarterback Cam Fancher went to. So nice little connection there in Dayton. You can tell Marshall's really working the state of Ohio. Um, Hammonds is a 2024 edge rusher, like you said, consensus three star guy from all of the you know mo the major recruiting services. If you're into the stars thing, six five two thirty, gotta like that. The number 36 prospect overall in the state of Ohio from 247 Sports had a um, little over a dozen offers, very Mac heavy, which you would expect in Ohio, mm -hmm. specifically in that Dayton area. You would expect a lot of Mac schools to be in on players from that area, but also, um, you know, Pitt. I mean, Pitt's got a pretty good resume of defensive linemen and defensive edge, uh, edge rushers, particularly. Um, and then Purdue, Indiana, and Georgia Tech to round out the P5 offers. Marshall was the only Sunbelt school to be in on uh, Mr. Hammonds. And you know what? You mentioned this pre uh, before we hit the record button, and, and I think you're right. It's because we are the closest kind of to the Ohio, you know, the state of Ohio. We know how concentrated the talent can be in the state of Ohio. This is a massive get uh, geographically for yeah. the herd, being able to – you know, be the closest school in the best G5 division in college football um, for recruiting. I think that's awesome, man. So good, good notice there. You know, I didn't really pay attention to that geographic thing, but this could be a big benefit to the herd. And, you know, if we, one thing we can never do is lighten our footprint in the state of Ohio. It's been just so good to Marshall over the years. And think about, I mean, Rasheen Ali's from Ohio. Brendan Knox was from Ohio. You know, all these big time players around there are more, right? But off the top of my head, those couple of runners, they leap off the page at you. Yeah. So nice little, nice little addition to the 2024 class. And, and again, we're edging ever closer. What are we like maybe six weeks or so ish from Probably early signing too. period? So we're gonna see some moves start to get made. Um, but interesting, interesting nonetheless. Volleyball, they dropped two matches to coastal, three sets to one on Friday and three sets to nothing on Saturday. Uh, that drops them to 12 and 14 overall and four and eight in the Sunbelt Conference. They travel to James Madison for a Friday Saturday matchup this week. Yeah, rough, rough go of it here late in the uh, conference slate for herd volleyball. And we've talked about how they've played better on the road than they have at the cam, which is kind of wild. You know, you would obviously think that trend would be just the opposite. Uh, but I did see that, uh, the account either herd volleyball or coach Ari tweeted out that the, uh, you know, the herd got bigger or something like that. So apparently mm -hmm. they've, they've uh, got gotten themselves a commit to the herd volleyball program, have not seen who that was uh, on social media at all. So when I find it, or if it's out there, when it's out there, I'll of course be able to share that with the herd fan base. All right. Next up we have, Men's golf, they tied for ninth at the Bryan National Collegiate. Ryan Bilby finished tied for 15th, and only one shot behind him was Joseph Kalaski, tied for 18th. Nice, nice. Yeah, pretty, two, top, pretty solid. two top 20s. Yeah, pretty solid. No, is, was this the last one of the of the fall season? This was. Uh, it's a running theme here. Uh, coastal, I mean, cross-country 
uh, was uh, that was the last fall thing for them, obviously being the Sun Belt Championships, men's golf, women's golf, women's soccer's over. Men's soccer just had theirs. Now they got the postseason tennis, uh, just about everything this week. And uh, it was the final for the fall. Well, I guess we'll gear up for some SBC championships then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, women's golf, they finished fourth in the French Broad Collegiate Inter- Invitational this week. Emily McClatchy led the team, finishing 11th overall. And Casey McElvain finished 12th. Again, cool. two top performers. Awesome. Uh, tennis, they picked up singles wins by Johanna Strom, Dorotea Joksovich, and Angela Lopicic as well as a doubles win by Emma Vander Hayden and Joke Sovich at the Gamecock shootout. Storm's win, of note here, came against the 39th-ranked player in the country. And the doubles victory, uh, one of their opponents, was the number three-ranked singles player in the country. So against some top competition, they came out with wins. That's really good to see. They traveled to the Liberty Invitational and that starts on Friday, and that will finish up their fall schedule. Cool. Yeah, I'm really, really looking for the uh, look forward to the spring slate, right? Yeah. I, I know that conference. it's not this way, but I feel like the uh, you know the fall slate is about like getting primed and ready for the spring yeah. season. I know it's not it, that way, but it feels like that way. There's a lot of uh, uh, collegiate uh, regional things that go yeah. on. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, n- still the names you rip off there are not surprising to us because right. we talk about them all the time. And Every if you're week. a new listener to the show, you really should be familiarizing yourself with names like Johanna Strom and Vander Hayden. And, you know, th- these are high performing herd athletes that will notch a ton of wins this season. So even if you're a casual herd fan, you can become a tennis fan relatively easy by getting to know the na- the names that Russ just ripped off there. And if, if you missed them, just, hit the rewind button a couple times and catch them because they'll, they'll they'll provide you with some pretty impressive stats as the spring season comes in. Men's basketball. They were down early in the fans first game versus Pikeville. And then they kicked it into high gear and ended up winning one Oh one to 69. Uh, Just real quick. We had talked about fans and reactions. That's one of those things. There were quite a bit of overreactions on Twitter uh, in a meaningless game. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it uh, sure looked like that the uh, let's see if I can do some quick math here. 79 to 29 after being down 40 to 22 uh, sure seemed like they closed out fairly well and played as a team for the first time. So uh, good showing by them overall. They also have another fans first game tonight at 7 p.m. And that's against Lee's McRae. Yeah, now look, I'm with you. It was a meaningless game, but it is not a meaningless game. When it's the first game of the year, this new look heard, you know, minus Kenzie, minus Taylor, minus Han Logden, lots of new, new, new. I get it. Now, Marshall went late and convincingly ran away from this game, but early on, it's not meaningless from the fans because it gives them an opportunity to go, oh, gosh, you Pike, man, really? So I get it, but A. How can you comp- how can you argue with the final <laughs> score of that game? It was uh, it was impressive, you know. It so it's going to be a work in progress. We know that. We know that. We know that. So um, I'm not going to hinge on every win, every loss, but they absolutely had to have a convincing win against U Pike in this first game because the first impression goes a long way. And though it started slow, it was a convincing impression by the end of the game. So I think this that fans' first game did a lot of good for the herd fan base to see um, just the the onslaught in the second half of that game. It, that was good. You needed to see that. So you know we've got tickets. Uh, they will be gone by the time people listen to this episode, obviously. But um, we sent a couple of folks to the game and, and sitting in our upper bowl seats, and we're going to do that all season long. So fans first again tonight, which, by the way, <clears throat> again, when people listen to this show, the game will already have happened. But um, pretty excited, really am. I, I, I'm excited to dig into this roster and kind of look at some things. And, you know, we'll have to get out a uh, basketball preview as a standalone, I guess, like really short. Maybe we'll have yeah. to try to work on it. I don't know when, you know, this weekend maybe or something just as a – just as a bust out episode, but yeah. um, 
very impressive by herd men, but not to be outdone by the herd women. Herd women had a really good showing here, 127 to 76 over Pike One, their fans' first game. Uh, I think it was eight players in double digits, and they uh, had a bunch of steals, and the coach said those weren't enough. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, you can really tell what a fun, fun, team this is going to be uh we don't expect to put up 127 points a game we don't expect to win by 50 a game uh on the average but you do expect that they will be high energy scoring a lot of points getting a lot of steals press uh shooting threes fast breaks you can expect it all if you're not got tickets yet get tickets this is going to be something fun to watch this year yeah it sure is and they're really cheap man really yeah. cheap to get the tickets i tell you um it was pretty cool to see that final stat and of course i was unable to watch the game obviously but you, you i think every player except maybe one on the herd roster scored so if that's the kind of brand of basketball, never mind the double digit scores, just everybody except for one player on the roster was able to get uh, at least a bucket. Dang, you know, that's got to be pretty nice. And and I love Coach Kim like, ah, yeah, well, you know, we smothered, but it wasn't smothering enough. It's like, I love it. I love it, man. This is uh, this is just turning out to initially be exactly what we hoped it would be. You know, exactly what we hoped it would be. Another program for fans to rally around and turn into a gen a revenue generator. Like, why can't herd women's basketball be a revenue sport? You know what I mean? Like, you can pack the cam for those games. They're really cheap uh, to go. Like, what was it? What is it? 25 bucks or something like that? Or 40 25. bucks? For can't beat that. For 25 for general admission. And then, uh, you know, you can set... Uh, I, I I can't remember what it was, but front row I think was fifty bucks or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, all right, uh, women's soccer. They finished the uh, regular season with a loss at Louisiana, one to nothing. And as we mentioned earlier, that was uh, Coach Michael Swan's uh, last game. Oh, I thought I, you. I, I was, no, no, <laughs> man. I don't want to. I don't want to say that when a man lost his job. I wasn't going to say it. Uh, the. Uh, the pun was there, but I don't want to say that because we we like Coach Swan. He was yeah, a, but I don't think that every, was a negative. That was a I, negative. Know, I know, but er, everyone uh, everyone loved Coach Swan. Uh, thought he was just a great guy in the community and stuff like that. His players loved him, so uh, you know our hopes are. Oh that, man, he's uh, capable. He'll bounce back. He'll have a job yeah. in no time. It, it, you yeah. know, this is not the end of his coaching career, but. Yeah, it, it was a it was a rough season for the herd women, and and you know they did not qualify for the postseason. I know that's the ultimate point you were trying yeah. to make. Yeah, uh, men's soccer we covered it in five things, but if you somehow missed it, Marshall won the regular season Sun Belt Conference Championship with a two nothing victory over South Carolina, and they host all of their games in the Sun Belt Conference tournament. First game is this Sunday, three p.m. Old Dominion. Yep, tickets available eight hundred the herd herdzone.com. Get over there and check them out. Uh, secure your seat, pack the vet, make it loud. Need all the energy we can get because conference tournament's time. Conference tournament time. Uh, you win this bad boy, only helps the seating nationally, you know. So uh, it's, it's the rubber has met the road. This was just step one in the three step process of conference champion, regular season, conference champion tournament, national championship. Let's roll. Yes, yeah, so that's all I got for around the herd. You got anything else you want me to take it out? Yep, take us out of here because we're going to come right back at you guys with this App State preview. Um, so take us out of here. All right, whether you see us at the cam, whether you see us at the Joan, or whether you see us struggling to walk with a cane or some crutches down at App State, hopefully I can make it. No matter where you see us, we're going to be saying, go herd. Go herd, this is Thundercast. Hang with us right back with an App State preview. It's Thundercast. Later. <laughs>